You're watching Democratically Speaking. Mark Lindy, your host. Uh, today I am here as a volunteer. This is on my own time as the chairman of the Democratic City Committee with Tim Cruz, who's a good Democrat and he's a candidate for re election in Ward 1. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me, Mark. Thanks for coming on. I live in Ward 1, and uh, you're my city you councilor, know. and you're running for re election. How many terms have you served? So I've far? served, I'll be finishing my fifth term now, so I'm just about 10 years, and uh, it's a long time. It's a very long time, and. Uh, I thought long and hard about whether I was going to run this year, and uh, I thought it was too important not to right now. There's a lot going on in the city, a lot good going on in the city, but a lot of things that uh, need some maturity and some uh, some experience. And I decided uh, after talking over my, with my wife, she said it was very important that I stay, and I agree, agree with her this time. Uh, at this time, that there's too much going on and too much important, uh, too many important things before the council to uh, to not stay and, and try to get those things done. Now, experience is, is, is key and important. You're going to have new faces on the City Council. In, in Ward 6, uh, Councilor Dubois is leaving. In Ward 5, Councilor DiNapoli is leaving. Uh, Councilor at Large Stewart is leaving. Right. Am I missing anybody? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think that's it. For okay. But that's three. That's, that's, it's not a third because it would be a fourth if there were right. 12. But that's a significant change. So you've been the Council President. Uh, right. At least twice? twice, twice, twice so far, and uh, usually they put you in there uh, a lot of times election year, so it's not uh, it's not as contentious. I purposely uh, both times that I ran for council president, I uh, chose to because it was a, an election year, and it's it's tough. And in politics, people need to get their word out and need to get their uh, uh, what they've done out. But uh, you don't want to have too much politicizing in the city council. If, You'd rather we need to get the work done, and I chose to run both years when it was an election year, purposely so I could try to keep the uh, council focused and on what they what we need to work on. Uh, I think my colleagues will tell you that I I run a, a good meeting, uh, you know, and th there are reasons that you need to have that those rules followed. We we go by Robert's rules, and again, that's part of the reason I think it's important to stay another another term, which I hope the voters in Ward One will uh, will put me back for another term. When you have new councilors. There are many great ideas, but you, you oftentimes don't understand the process, and the process needs to be followed. And I know I helped. I think you'd find other councilors, Councilor Barnes and Councilor Razak. I worked with Councilor Stewart's a great example, and he came in with many ideas, great ideas, and early on didn't understand that sometimes there's a process that you have to go through. And he now, uh, you know, we've become great friends on the council, and uh, as he's learned the process and been able to really step up and understand what we can do as a council and what we can't do. And uh, I really think that, um, that uh, not just my experience at how the council runs, but this particular year has been a very contentious year uh, with the city council. And we, we run the risk a little bit of, uh, of the Washington syndrome, of not getting things done just because we, as a group, or, or dig, your heel, dig your heels in. There's too much too many important things going on in the city for us to ha take things personal. Uh, I make no bones about the fact that two years ago I supported Linda Belzotti for mayor. I think she was a good mayor. Uh, Bill Kapner ran and won. And when he came in, my belief is the people of the city put him in the spot. And I could do one of two things. I could decide that I didn't want to work with him. And all that does is move our city backwards. And w that's, that's not the right way to go. I think one of the strengths I do bring to the council is the idea that I'm able to talk to all of the councillors and try to find the best way to compromise between some of the things that the mayor wants to do, some of the things that uh, other councillors want to do, and find that common ground to get things done. And again, that's why you need that mature, sober uh, representation because, again, there's very, some great things going on in the city, but there are also some things that we have to fight hard to, uh, to, to every time well, you can do a ribbon cutting, but every time there's a gunshot, we move two steps backwards. And uh, we, need, we need leadership there to help get those things done, to give the police and the fire the tools they need to, uh, to uh, fight those, uh, the fights on the street. And then the other part is I've been a great advocate for the schools. And long term, the, the way you solve public safety problems is through the school system. Now, that's not the short term. It takes a long time, but it takes, not to use the old cliche, but it takes a village to raise, raise a child. And what we do in our public schools here in this city are so important 
that uh, that's how we long-term solve those public safety issues. And I tell you, you know, you know that I do the play-by-play -play for the Brockton High soccer. Um, the kids on the soccer team are the greatest group of kids. That uh, and that's those are some of the kids I get to know through my son, who's a senior at Brockton High. Those things that we do, those kids are great kids who. Uh, uh, moving into becoming the adults in the city now, they're seniors in high school, and I'm very excited about the future with the kids coming in, but we need people now to help fight that fight on the short term with the public safety, but in the long term help the schools to, to be able to raise and teach good children. Now differentiate yourself from your opponent. You're, you have a rematch. Two years ago, same opponent. I never say names, okay? I don't know if you choose to, but it was a close election. It was a close election. You're energized, you're focused. How do you differentiate yourself? What are you going to tell? I mean, you get a closing statement at the end, but tell your constituents, tell your voters in Ward 1 why you're better. Mr. Sedell, Tom Sedell ran against me two years ago, and he ran a great campaign. And, uh, and I will, I'll be the first to admit I took him somewhat for granted. But as I've gotten to know what he stands for, and again, everybody has a right to their opinion, but there are people out there who think there are simple answers to difficult questions. The group he's involved with, the Citizens for Limited Taxation, believe that Jay Condon hides money and that this city doesn't need, not only doesn't need to raise taxes, but could get rid of many of the taxes we have. I'll be the first to admit nobody wants to pay taxes, but we, ha we need to raise the revenue to, to fight these issues in the, in the streets and uh, in our schools. And, uh, you know, Mr. Sedell and the people that he's associated with, Mr. Zaccaro and all, think that these are simple problems that can be solved with blue smoke and mirrors. You know, I can tell you my experience. I know the budget. I know where the money comes from. I know where the money goes to. And I know, and again, that experience I talked about, I know what things we can do as a council and what things we can't do. Uh, again, nobody wants to be, uh, you know, as a Democrat, you get tagged all the time as a tax and spend liberal. Well, I'm not a tax and spend liberal. I don't think anybody wants to, on the local level, raise taxes. But unfortunately, we have, I've been the leader, and we're going to probably pass a water rate increase shortly. It's unfortunate, and it's going to be a fairly large increase. Now, 30% sounds huge. It'll be 30% over three years. But the problem is, because we've been afraid to, I've tried to get us to go 2.5% every other year for the past 10 years then people wouldn't have such a large increase. Now, what people like Mr. Sedell don't understand is that water rate increase, if we don't pass it, gets passed on to the taxpayers. Well, the water rate, the water rate is paid by about 1,000 users in Whitman and about 1,000 users in Abington and some in East Bridgewater. By not putting the water rate in, in play, we now force the people of Brockton, the taxpayers of Brockton, to subsidize water for, for part of Whitman and part of Abington and part of East Bridgewater. Those are the things that you can't, you can have a simple answer, no, we can't have a water rate increase. Well, that's wonderful, but we're on, we are under state order to replace the water main on Torrey Street. If we don't do it, the state will come in and do it and just bill us. And then we have to pay it. At least this way, we have control over it. And if we can get some of those things done, we then can do hopefully smaller increases in the past, in the future. And in fact, the 30% increase over three years averages out to about $35 per user per quarter. So that's not good, but it's also, it, it's for most people, it's not a killer. Now, um, a lot of issues coming up that have been reoccurring. I mean, you've been there for 10 years, okay? You're hearing the same thing every election. Power plant, desal plant, um, Stonehill with the, with, the, with the sewer rates. Right. Um, everything's old as new again. I mean, um, exactly. we, we have a former mayor running for councilor at large now who was a school committee member and a mayor. Yeah, now he's looking to be a city councilor. Another constituent of mine. Right, yeah. Ward 1. Um, how do you see some of these key issues? Um, sometimes you get tired of talking about them and tired of hearing about them, but they're really important issues. They are really important issues, and that's... I think people do get tired of them, and sometimes you have to look at the whole picture. Um, different issues tend to stay in, in, in the forefront. You know, the power plant is something that, you know, I've been against, and uh, I certainly can't discuss what's going on in the executive session, but our lawyers have come to us now, and the city council is being sued 
um, you know, there is a point when, we, you know, we have to look, and again, Mayor Carpenter basically has the ball is in his court. It's in the court's system. We've asked for some uh, some rulings by the courts, and they've said, no, not yet. We'll wait till uh, all the discovery is done. But we can only fight as a council to while we have appropriations for that. The mayor appropriates the money for the law department. And at this point, he has said he won't appropriate more money to fight the power plant. So we'll have to see where that goes from here. Again, it's in the hands of the courts. I've been against it all along. I'll be honest with you, I'm not a scientist. I mean, it gets frustrating with everybody who thinks they understand science. My belief is I probably have as much pollution in Ward 1 every day with Route 24 going through uh, Ward 1. However, I do think it's a, a, a financial issue. I think the property values in the area will drop so much that any increase in tax revenues from the power plant will be offset by the drop in tax revenues from, uh, that's been my belief all along, is that it will affect property values in that area so strongly that it, it, it's a net loss for the city financially. Um, the desal plant, I happen to be a believer that we do need a second source of water, and I think the water main break that happened about three months ago, should, if that doesn't warn us that we need a second source of water, nothing will ever get through to some people. However, $88 million if, to buy that, if that were to come to us, I, I couldn't see $88, $88 million to buy it. I would like to have us look into long-term um, a, a regional water authority, work with some of these towns, get the state involved, and have the water authority purchase the, uh, the plant. It would help Brockton, and we have first, first uh, refusal on most of the things that can happen there. I think we could make a, a, a great uh, debate and a great discussion for a regional water authority. There are cities and towns in the area. I think Aquaria has definitely dropped the ball on, uh, I'm very disappointed to see that the uh, Southgate or whatever, the Southfield over at the old Weymouth Air Base is getting their water from the, uh, has just signed on to get their water from the MWRA. This would have been a perfect pr opportunity for us to say, you know, negotiate. You know, right now, Aquaria likes to say to us, oh, the water is too expensive, we can't sell it. Nobody came to us and said, well, can we negotiate? We should have. Do you get angry as a counselor with the continued delay from Aquaria? Absolutely. Um, there's no question. And again, I've been more of the voice of reason that, listen, we have the contract. And I think some people, to go back to the plant in particular, first off, people, a lot of people either don't want to listen or don't understand. The state made us come up with a second source of water. Twenty-odd years ago, they, the state said, you will have a second source of, of, of water. We looked at the MWRA before I was there, long before I was there, and it was much too expensive, and we would have no control over that. Basically, you get a weighted vote in the MWRA. Boston, the city of Boston, sets the rates, sets everything. They have the, their weighted vote out, outweighs everybody else's vote. So that, we looked at the price of that, and that was not a viable situation. The Water Commission at the time looked at that with some very intelligent people on that board. You know, I know Mr. Zoino was on that board and a very good Water Commission we had back then, which we, we do have now. I'm not stating that we don't, but a very people that were in that business and they looked at it and said that wasn't as good a, a, a way to go. We have this. We still need this. I think we need to get Aquaria to the, to the table and understand that they have work to do. They should be out marketing this. I don't believe they've marketed this well enough. And we can't get them to come to the table. And as I said at a council meeting a few weeks ago, when they finally did come, and their lawyer basically did all the talking, which bothered me a lot. And basically I told them, all we've asked you is show us. It was a pretty simple request. They have to prove they spent $250,000 in marketing over 10 years. It should be pretty simple, and we still don't have anything that we can trust on that as any real information on that and yes I am very frustrated that we can't get answers on that and again we're holding that money up right now and that is n not a good situation. How did that vote go down? It was a majority of the councilors that withheld the money. I know Councilor Rodriguez brought it to the table. And I'll be honest with you when Councilor Rodriguez first proposed that I voted against it. Um, I didn't think that was the right way to get them to the table. I didn't think they'd come just c because we said that and I was proven wrong. Councilor Rodriguez was 100 percent right. We held that we, we voted to hold that payment up, and the next meeting, the Aquaria representatives were there and had been 
a year, a year and a half bef since we've been asking for them to come. So I, I stand corrected on that. And uh, they have been in, and they've given us some information, but not what we need. And uh, not enough for us to look and say, okay, you've done your job. And if you haven't done your job, then maybe we do need to walk away, look at the law department, maybe he needs to look. And Attorney Nazarella has his opinion at this point is that they have fulfilled their, uh, their uh, obligations. I don't know that that's true. So every Monday night at City Council of FinCom, there's discussion, there's debate, sometimes there's dissension, okay? Um, we were hoping to have a debate with your opponent in Ward 1. We were able to get um, three city council debates, the other contested races, uh, four school committee debates, yeah. or maybe it's the other way around. I did so many debates yesterday, <laughs> I can't remember them. We did a council at large rate. Are you, are you disappointed that you can't go one-to-one -one with your opponent? Yeah, absolutely. And again, we did two years ago. And um, I think you tend to not want to debate when you know that your facts are wrong. And I think as, as, as you get into peeling away the layers of what the Citizens for Limited Taxation are saying, I think they realize that it's not, it's not factual. That Mr. Cohen doesn't have hidden accounts. And, and in fact, I can tell you that this city would have been taken over by the state in receivership years ago if it weren't for Mr. Condon. He, is, he has kept this city on the up and up uh, financially I can't tell you how important he's been to the city. One of the things that has to happen through the next two years is that we need to come up with a su succession plan. Mr. Condon's not getting any younger, and the way he's been treated, I'm amazed that we still have him here. Um, and I'm so happy we do, but we need to come up with a succession plan so that we're ready that when he steps out, somebody has to be ready to step into that seat. Now, um, last year during the whole debate on the power plant, not the power plant, the casino, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, you and your fellow counselors, Ward 2, Tom Monahan, Ward mm -hmm. 3, Dennis and Neri, had a public meeting right over at West Middle School yep. to, to talk about it, to vet it. Right. Um, I never thought in a million years that it would be as close a vote as it was. I, I was surprised. I, I, I was yep. very surprised. Um, why was that important and, you know, to get the residents' input and to find out what people in Ward 1 were thinking? Well, and I think less to get their input because this was, in fact, is what we should have done with the uh, power plant probably 15 years ago when it first was proposed. This was on the ballot, so the voters, their input was direct in this case. Uh, this was more about getting the information to the voters and not to sell it. I, I said early on, and the enterprise really tried to push all of the councilors, how do, how do you feel on it? Well, my thought was it's not up to me to sell it or, or be against it publicly because this was on the ballot. This was pure pure democracy. This was a, a binding referendum that the public got to vote on. Um, I happen to be personally in favor uh, of it. I think it's something that could be, make a huge difference for the city of Brockton. But the, the idea of the meeting like that was to get the, the public able to get information f to meet the people who are proposing the, the plant. You know, the Kearney family owns the fairgrounds and will be a, a minority partner in this if it moves ahead. But uh, the, the Rush Gaming people are the ones who uh, proposing this. They're the ones that do this for a living. They're the ones that looked at this and said this is a viable uh, spot and have spent a lot of money already to come in and and, and I felt it was important as the the ward councilor where the fairground sits and Councilor Monahan and Councilor Greenery, the three of us about the uh, fairgrounds to hold that meeting and to, uh, uh, to let them make their presentations to the public, let the public question them and get uh, get answers and whatever answers they got so they can make their own minds up. In fact, it's, you know, one of the things, I'm, I don't do a lot of monthly ward meetings. I, I, I don't think people realize how much they cost the city when you bring in, you know, a police officer and a firefighter and whatever department heads that in many cases are getting paid. And those are usually just the same 10 or 12 people that come. What I have had through the years is when there's a particular issue. I've had meetings, and I think they're I think they're much more important. I've hosted two public safety meetings with Councilor Monahan through the last four years, where we've had 300 people at each one, and where the last at the last public safety meeting we had not just the mayor and the police chief, and we had the FBI, the head of the FBI for Boston, the head of ICE, uh, we had the DA, we had at the last one the, uh, the U.S. Attorney sent somebody. Um, 
that's getting all the stakeholders. We had uh, Major Thomas from the state police who have been a huge help to us as, with an on-demand police department who do a great job, but we do not have enough police officers. We will, you know, start to a starting to try to add to that, but without the state police, we would be even farther behind the eight ball in the public safety. So those public safety meetings were able to tell the people, sometimes it's just letting them get something off their chest, but for the most part, we're able to tell the public what is going on in those crime fighting efforts so that they understand what, what's going on in the neighborhoods. Now, uh, recently, and uh, we're, we're right in the middle of October, we're um, going to run this probably close to the day of the election, mm -hmm. so I don't want to date it too much, but there's a number of financial issues that have come before the council, okay? Um, there's a $13.6 million bonding package that's up, you know, for, for discussion and everything to buy ess essential things like like a fire fire truck <laughs> a fire truck police cruisers things right. like that there's also talk in the same meetings about a two and a half override or a debt exclusion or anything like that um, especially because you brought up you know like Brocktonians for limited taxation what's your take on responsible government bonding two and a half overrides debt exclusion you said nobody wants to raise taxes right. or nobody wants to charge people more what's your thought well and in fact I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding. The only discussion about a Prop 2.5 override or a debt exclusion came from Mr. Condon's letters that, in his opinion, and that's part of the state law that set up Mr. Condon's position. Back in the early 90s when we were going into receivership, the state, the state came in, the Department of Revenue, and said you will have a chief financial officer who has to certify. Now, the certify is just his opinion. The council makes the decisions on what to spend. The certification is just his opinion on, and it's an important opinion that, for us to look at, on how he thinks we can f finance these things. He would rather see a Prop 2.5 override or a debt exclusion to fund most of those things. Just like anybody, I have a mortgage on my house. W what you can inside of your financial ability to pay, I, we go to bonding. I would, I would not vote to put the, on a ballot a Prop 2.5 override or a debt exclusion because I can tell you it is not going to pass in this city. The people aren't ready for it. And I think it is almost throwing your hands up and giving up a little bit. Inside the bonding, we, the, the Department of Revenue for the state doesn't allow you to borrow more than you can afford to pay. So by, by bonding, we can pay for those things. I mean, we, we need the fire trucks. Uh, you know, we're, nobody wants to be the one that didn't have the, the hook and ladder come to their house and they won't, re they won't remember the extra $40 or so on their tax bill that it costs for that bonding. They'll remember that the fire department was there to save their life, and which they do. And we, we, have, you know, we have so many older, they may, be, they may look okay because they're painted, but we have old equipment. The police cruisers are going all day long. They, they pick up 100,000 miles in no time. Some of these are almost dangerous mm -hmm. for us to, uh, for our people to be driving. Um, we have to look at those and say, okay, we need to go to, we need to bond these, borrow this money, and and buy, buy these certain things. What we really need to do, but it's very difficult, is have a capital plan going forward. We've actually had to go to bond and do, do some work on the schools. Now we've been fortunate that the school uh, assistance board, the uh, school building authority, school building authority, Mark, mm -hmm. of course, as as a school committeeman for for southeastern regional knows it. Uh, we've been fortunate that we've gotten in the past 90% reimbursement on most projects, and in some it's been 80%, but uh, some of those costs aren't, aren't re reimbursable, so we have to come up with some of those costs. We can't have kids and we can't have teachers in schools where the, the ceilings are falling down over their heads. Um, we need to look at a, a long-term capital plan for some things like fire stations. Uh, to be quite honest, we're very fortunate that fire and police stations, we're very fortunate that we haven't had some firemen or police officers sue the city for the uh, working conditions they're in in some of the buildings. The building department has done yeoman's work to make them work, but we're in, some of our fire stations are 100 years old, over 100 years old. 
But we have a new library that's not new anymore. Not new anymore. We have an East Branch library that we renovated. We have a West Branch library that we still need to do. And we were happy to see, like, the Library Foundation step up to the plate. And then the city also matched some of the money Absolutely. because they gave us the cost to keep them open additional hours. But we needed security. We needed other ancillary things to go along with it, utilities. Um, bonding, I mean, I think the best thing the state ever did was set up the school building authority Absolutely. because there's a penny on the sales tax that goes dedicated to school buildings. And right. I know, Tim, you were on the forefront back in the day when, when Jack Units was mayor. There was a whole possible campaign to do a debt exclusion at the time, and, and people looked at it, and we didn't think it was going to fly. Now, someone like me who had kids in the school, someone Absolutely. like you that had kids in the school, What's a couple more dollars to, to, to have safe schools with new roofs and not leaky boilers and all of that stuff? But you can't, some people, A, can't afford it, and some people just won't accept it. Well, it's two, two thoughts I have on that. Number one, when people say to me, but I don't have any kids in the school, well, that doesn't matter. A good school system keeps your property values high. So a good school system, even if, you know, I have one left, I have a senior in high school, and he's out next year. I won't be saying, well, I don't have anybody in the school, what do I care? A good school system is one of the things that keeps, it's probably the biggest thing other than public safety that keeps property values high. And one of the things we have is a great school system. And this city has long time ago made the decision to invest in its schools. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's a, you have to weigh what's there, but quite often we hear the, how shorthanded we are in police. and we get New Bedford and Fall River told how many police officers they have. Well, at the same time, they made a decision years ago on what they would spend their money on. Both of those school systems have some schools either in state receivership or just about to be put into state receivership. We don't. And in fact, through the years when we've had problems, we've addressed them. You know, the Huntington School was, uh, I want to say four years ago, was approaching a status that the state uh, gave it a warning and said, you know, you need to fix this. Well, June Saber and the staff down there, that school is now a, a pillar of, of what you can do with an extended school day when you really concentrate. That school now is used by the state as an example as on how model. you can fix a school. Exactly. And uh, that's, so that's a, a, a commitment the people of Brockton made historically to the schools. And again, we need to balance that some. We do need, we need more police officers, there's no question. It just is very difficult. You don't put 50 police officers on and in one year. Cut something else. Yeah. Okay, we got about two minutes left, I think. So look in the camera, talk to the voters, why Tim Cruz, why you should be reelected. Thank you. Thank, first of all, I want to thank BCA and Mike Lindy for having me here. I'd like to ask the people of Ward 1 to send me back to uh, City Hall. I think my experience, my maturity, my common sense judgment is really needed, particularly at this time where we have so much good going on. We have so much building going on downtown. We have a lot of things going well, but we need to make sure we're moving forward on those things and at the same time fighting against those issues where you need to get guns off the streets of the city, but we can't just be fighting with each other. We can't make simple, we can't use simple answers for, for difficult questions. So please send me back to the uh, City Council for two more years. I thank you and I thank you for the last 10 years of support. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very um, much. We'll Mark. be watching the election, and uh, we want to make sure everybody votes. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you're watching Democratically Speaking. Mark Lindy, your host. Stay tuned for more candidates and coverage of election 2015 right here in the City of Champions.